Section 8 of Astounding Stories 20, August 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 20, August 1931. Section 8. The Midget from the Island by H. G. Winter. Part 3. Garth floundered down to the beach and ran to where the craft usually lay. There was only a groove in the rough, pebbly surface, a groove left by the boat's keel. He followed it up the bank, and twenty yards in found the dinghy chained and locked firmly to a large tree. The midget's face grew suddenly very haggard as he stood there, staring at what looked like his death sentence. He should have known Hagendorf would secure the boat, he told himself bitterly. It was a cruel blow, and sheer misery of mind and body gripped him. As he turned and peered through the darkness of a wind-whipped water and sky towards a horizon that was already lightening, down river lay Detroit, a friendly, everyday world. It was not far in miles, but it seemed lost to him forever. Garth took his eyes from that prospect with a wry twist to his mouth. It chanced that they fell on the painter of the rowboat. It was a stout manila cord some twenty feet in length, and tied tightly to a ring in the bow of the boat. He looked at it dully for a full minute before the idea came to him. Then suddenly the lethargy bred of hopelessness left him. Garth remembered a pocket knife he had left in the boat the day before. He climbed over the side and began to fumble about in the darkness. First he came upon a torn handkerchief, which he hastily tied about his loins. Further probing disclosed the knife wedged under a seat in the boat, when he finally extricated it. He threw the knife over the side and climbed out. After some minutes of frantic cutting and hacking, he severed the rope, and quickly taking up one of the ends, ran with it further along the bank. There was still a way of getting off the island, a cold and risky way, but better than waiting miserably for capture. On the bank was a pile of sawn logs intended for firewood, and a strong rope was in his hands. Much, indeed, could be done now. The making of his raft proved a Herculean task, a racking, an almost impossible one for a man, limited by doll-sized hands and a foot-high body. First, the logs had to be rolled to the water's edge, six of them. Each was as thick as he was tall and this first part of his task took him a precious half-hour, every minute of which brought nearer the dawn. Ripples, like ordinary waves, washed up the struggling mannequin and left him gasping, as he stood braced in the cold water and hugged one log after another out, and wound the rope under and over it. The raft had to be built in water. He would never have been able to drag the whole thing off the beach. When at last he wearily tied the rope end to the last log and stuck his knife handy in it, the clouds on the horizon were flushed by the coming sun. But his means of escape was completed, and hanging on the end, he shoved the raft out into the river. Right then he almost lost his life. For when his feet left the sloping bottom, his great weight out of all proportion to the size of his body pulled him under, and it was only by virtue of a desperate clutch on the raft that he escaped drowning. Thrashing furiously, he struggled up from the water and lay totally blown on the logs. It was then he first realized that his chance of life was no stronger than the rope which held them together, for swimming was out of the question. And one or two logs would never support his hundred and eighty pounds. The end which he lay on was well under water, and the waves splashed up between the bobbing logs. The current he was headed for swept down fifty yards offshore, which was a sixth of a mile to the little legs now thrust out behind and making a rhythmic flutter. He was off the island. Freedom and life were near. Though his teeth were chattering, his fingers crushed by the jarring logs, and his body utterly wretched, he grinned with joy as the stretch between him and the gloomy mass of the island slowly widened. Then came the sun. The skies faded from gray into a delicate, cloud-flecked blue, 
Slowly the air warmed, and the surface of the water seemed to calm under it. Though the sun was good on his body, Garth realized night was more friendly to him, for in the growing light his craft was all too conspicuous to the giant, who would presently be following his tracks down to the beach. He chided himself for not having thought of camouflaging the raft with leafy branches. Doggedly he forced it out. When at last he felt the pull of the current, he seized his weary kicking and glanced up into the swiftly advancing dawn. There was a bird soaring through the keen air up there, gliding in easy circles with almost motionless wings. Garth gazed at it somewhat wistfully, envying its freedom and power of flight, and then he shut his eyes. He was very tired. He must have dozed off for a moment, for he awoke to find himself slipping off. With a sudden jerk he regained his position, and that was what saved his life at the moment, for without warning while he was nodding, plumed death struck from the skies. It dropped like a plummet, as was its manner. It had been circling above and judging its swoop, and by rights its curved talons should have arched deep into the unguarded back of the naked figure on the raft, but at the last second the figure moved aside too late for the hawk to alter its swoop. The raft rocked under the impact. For a moment, Garth Howard, dazed by the sudden attack, did not know what happened. Huge scratching wings were thrashing about him. His left arm stung from where a claw had raked it, and he wrenched around to stare into two wicked slits of eyes, behind a fierce rounded beak that jabbed at him. Evidently he represented easy prey to the hawk, for it did not soar away, but instead came at him again in a flurry of beating wings and stabbing beak, a vicious feathered fighter from above. Caught off guard by the suddenness and savagery of the onslaught, Garth retreated stumblingly, forgetting his weight and the size of the raft, and defending himself with his arms as best he could against the rushes of the hawk. The raft tilted perilously. Water washed around his legs, and he slipped and went under. He felt his fingers slipping inexorably over the edge of the log he had gripped. His legs threshed up a welter of foam, but he kept going down. Panic clutched him. His weight would sink him like a stone. But suddenly his clutching hand was gripped by steel-like talons, and through the water he caught a glimpse of the hawk, straining backwards with mighty sweeps of its wings in an effort to lift him bodily into the air. His size had deceived it. It could not hoist him, but did manage to drag his head and chest out of the water. That was enough. With an effort, Garth scrambled onto the raft. The hawk, probably greatly surprised by its failure to soar away with such tiny prey, tore into him again, raking his body painfully. Hardly knowing what he did, Garth grabbed out as it hovered over him and succeeded in wrapping his fingers around one of its legs. Then, bracing himself as best he could and ignoring the scratching wings and piercing beak, he gave the leg a sharp twist and heard the crack of breaking bone. He was only half conscious of the hawk's shrill scream of pain, of its swift retreat into the blue, with the broken leg dangling grotesquely. For a moment he was aware that he had driven it off, then the pain of his wounds and his utter exhaustion swept over him, and he flopped down on the raft in a dead faint. For a long time Garth was dimly aware of familiar noises. At first they were faint and scarcely perceptible, but as his senses slowly began to return, disturbing thoughts came to him. He felt that he was on his back and confined and when he twisted to turn over he found he could not. He opened his eyes and blinked. He was back in the laboratory, lying bound hand and foot on the long table. The giant Hagendorf appeared over him, and his deep voice rumbled, Badly scarred and bruised, my little friend. Cats you have fought, and birds, and each has left its mark. It was useless to run away last night, not... Garth was suddenly too full of a weary resignation to even think of speaking. Remonstrance, he knew, would avail him nothing. The long struggle for freedom and life was over, and he had lost. The assistant was apparently in good humor. He went on. 
Really, it is too bad, after that magnificent fight of yours. A hawk, was it not? I was following your tracks, and had just reached the beach when I see a great fuss in the water. A raft, I see, a bird attacking something on it. A little white figure struggling. Well, it is that easy. I unlock the boat and go to the raft and find my elusive friend there, unconscious. So I bring him back here. He has forgotten we have an experiment to complete. There was a fire of exultation in the man's eyes as they glared down at the midget who lay on the laboratory table just a few feet away from the chamber of the machine. He reached out and ran a thick finger over his victim's body. You do not deserve this, he said. I should kill you outright, but graciously I give you death in the machine. Yours will be the first human body to be reduced to an inch, maybe less. This is your martyrdom. For this your name will live, along with mine, for having perfected the process. Garth Howard saw that the window was boarded tightly shut. Then Hagendorf caught his eyes, as with a grin he plunged a hand into the pocket and drew forth the missing panel switch. He dangled it in front of Garth. What you would have given for this last night, eh? With your wire to pull the lever so carefully arranged. Ah, it was too bad. He shrugged, then picked up a screwdriver and turned to fix the switch on the control panel. The moment his back was turned, Garth gazed frantically around. The fantastic fate he had striven so desperately to stave off was very close now. What could he do? Some tools lay on the table, just out of his reach, among them a pair of cutting pliers. He stared at the pliers, an overgrown tool half as long as his own body. The twist of Hagendorf's wrist driving home the first screw brought a cold chill over him. The pliers. It was a chance. He twisted a little, and keeping his eyes on the giant's back, he inched towards them. His hands tied at the wrists behind him, clutched for them, found them. The jaws were open, and there were two sharp cutting edges. He could not hope to manipulate the whole implement with his bound hands, but he located one edge, painfully brought the rope to it, and sawed rapidly. The steel sliced his flesh, and he felt the warm stickiness of blood. But he disregarded this and kept on. Hagendorf was still working, all unconscious. But the last screw was going in, and then some strands of the rope snapped, and it loosened. The next second, Garth had wrenched his hands free. Then, throwing caution to the winds, he sat up, grabbed the great tool, and sliced the rope at his feet. At that moment, Hagendorf finished his job and turned around. Their eyes met. For a breathless instant, nothing happened, save that the smile on the titan's face changed to surprise and then fury. Garth scrambled to his feet. The movement brought a bellow of rage, and the mannequin saw two enormous hands converging on him in a sweep that bade fair to crush every bone in his dwarfed body. Leaping backwards, instinctively he hurled the pliers at the giant's head. They were well aimed, and he saw them strike the temple, stopping the man in his tracks. He thundered more from anger than pain. His heart pounding wildly, Garth ran back to a position behind a rack of test tubes. It was from there that he saw Hagendorf cursing crazily, grab up a machinist's hammer, and advance upon him. All sanity had apparently left the giant. His great face was flushed and distorted, and a growing welt showed where the pliers had clipped him. Garth suddenly knew that if he were captured again, death would not come in the chamber, but from those powerful hands, or the weapon they clutched. The hammer swung back for a crushing blow, but in the instant it hung poised. Garth lifted a half-filled test tube from the rack before him and swished its contents forward. The tube held sulfuric acid, and it sprayed over Hagendorf's face. The hammer pitched from his hand. He clutched at his eyes and stumbled back, shrieking in agony. Garth at once ran to the edge of the table, swung himself over, and slid down the leg to the floor. The laboratory door was opened, and he dashed for it. 
but whether or not Hagendorf could see his frantic retreat, he anticipated it, and with a reeling plunge he got there first. Fumbling, he found the key in a hole and turned it. The room was sealed. Beginning then, the blind Hagendorf was a man berserk. With a sobbing roar of pain and fury, he lashed round for the foot-high figure that dodged and wheeled and zigzagged to keep from his threshing arms and his hands. A table crashed over, and a flood of chemicals mixed and boiled on the floor. Then another, as the giant blundered blindly into it. The cages of animals split open, and guinea pigs, rabbits, and insects scuttled from their prisons, fleeing to the corners from the wild plunges of the raging German. Garth went reeling from a glancing blow, and fell against an overturned stool under a far table, where he could hardly breathe from the mixed odors of spilt chemicals. By some sixth sense, Hagendorf seemed to locate him, for his huge body turned and came directly for him. But Garth did not wait. Seizing the stool, he whirled it so that it slid, smashed into the giant's legs. The man pitched over with a grunt, striking the floor so hard that the planks shivered. He did not rise. He lay there in a wreckage of glass and splintered wood and stinking chemicals, moaning slightly. Garth wasted no time, but gripped the leg of the laboratory table, shinned to the top, and with frantic speed fixed his strand of wire onto the control lever and round the supporting posts of the instrument panel. Then he jumped for the dynamo switch, caught the handle, and jerked it down. The drone of the generator surged through the room. Then the midget was standing in the chamber, both ends of the wire in his hands, and his heart was thudding madly as he pulled one of them. It held overcame the lever halfway. The brilliant stream of the ray poured down. Dimly the mannequin glimpsed the chamber's walls sinking down, the wreckage strewn room outside diminishing to normal size. Fiery pain throbbed through him, but it was lost in the exultation that filled his mind as the seconds went by. He grew to two feet, two and a half, three, but beyond that he was not to go. The swaying shape of Hagendorf loomed outside the cube. Aroused by the drone of the generator and what it signified, the giant had floundered up from the floor and now came clutching blindly for him. Garth knew he would have to leave the chamber at once, so, struggling for command of his muscles through the paralysis that numbed them, he tensed his hold on the other wire and pulled it a little. The control lever swung back to neutral, the ray faded, and Garth jumped out. He was only a few feet away from the huge, convulsed face as the German roared, By God, you'll never get back on this machine. His purpose was plain. His groping hand had already found the control lever. To prevent his ripping it out, Garth plunged headfirst into Hagendorf's stomach, and they both went down in a flurry of arms and legs. Garth, scrambling to get loose, was conscious of the ray pouring down again in the chamber above. The lever had not been wrenched out, but jerked over, setting the process of increase on. The next few minutes were a chaos. Now that Howard was three feet tall, he was without some of the advantages of his former smallness and compactness, and his utmost efforts failed to free him from the death clutch of the pain-maddened giant. Over and over they rolled on the floor, Garth trying only to break free, and the other relentlessly holding on and dragging him over to the chamber again. It was a losing fight for the diminutive one. Weakened as he was by his exposure and the fierce fights he had had, little by little, squirming and resisting with all his remaining strength, he was brought near to see the German at last pull half the reducing apparatus with a crash to the floor. The ray in the chamber faded off. The machine was silenced forever, so that Garth could never hope to regain his full size in this one. With the realization of this, most of his spirit went, while the savage giant, successful in smashing the machinery, now turned and devoted himself exclusively to his victim. Now for you, he roared in a frightening triumph. Clutching the smaller man's neck with his great hands, and bearing him to the floor. Against those fingers gouged into his windpipe like a vice of steel, Garth could do nothing. Feebly he gagged, and feebly he clawed at the pitiless hands 
and futilely. It was the end, he told himself. He had come close, but closest did not count. His eyes bulged, and a shroud of black began to obscure his vision. And then, suddenly, over the giant's flexed arms, he glimpsed, coming from the chamber on the table, something that chilled the blood in his veins with horror. It was huge and utterly loathsome. Long, hairy legs folded out, and following them came a furry, bloated body at least five feet thick. Many faceted eyes fixed themselves coldly on the men on the floor. In one hideous leap, the monster soared from the table all the way to the room's ceiling, seeming almost to float as it came down. For a moment it teetered on the floor, not five feet from the giant, who, blind and all unconscious of it, was throttling his diminutive victim beneath him. Garth, for a second, forgot the grip on his throat and the horror of the monster. He knew at once what it was, a tarantula. It had crawled inside the chamber when its cage was broken, had been there even while he had been there, and had been swollen to its present blood-curdling size while they were fighting and the ray was on. With the smashing of the apparatus, it was free to come out. It gathered for the final spring, its terrible legs tensing perceptibly, a creature out of a nightmare. Garth Howard tried to shriek out a warning, but Hagendorf was holding his throat too well. He could only struggle weakly and nod toward the horror beyond. But the message did not get across to the giant. Then the tarantula sprang again. For a moment it seemed to hover on Hagendorf's upturned back. When it floated down, its ragged legs cradled over him, and the egg-shaped body squatted on his back. Garth felt his frayed nerves and senses going. A hairy leg was touching him, chilling his flesh. Above him the giant was thrashing impotently, and he found his neck free of the awful grip. He wormed free. He was hardly conscious of reaching up and unlocking the door and closing it tightly again as he stumbled forth. Later it seemed that it was in a dream that he ran wildly into the splendid sunlight outside and down the winding trail. It was only by a tremendous effort that he kept his senses long enough to shove the rowboat out from the beach and hop in. He never started the motor. All that he had seen and suffered on the island of horror overcame him too soon, and he pitched down in a limp, unconscious heap. And so it was that the next morning the two harbor policemen found a rowboat with mysterious cargo floating silently down the Detroit River. So it was that some time later a launch with three local officers churned up to the solitary island, and that gunshots echoed in the gloom of a hushed laboratory room, and a man's white-faced body was carried from the cabin where he had made his one great treacherous effort to steal another's fame. End of section 8